introduction. So, um, <clears throat> first of all, my name is David Nally. My contact information's uh, up on the screen. Uh, feel free to send me an email, uh, berate me on Twitter if you vehemently disagree with me. Um, so, I'll kind of set the stage. What I hope to do uh, today is to do a mix of both theory and practice on setting up a test dev cloud and doing that with Apache Cloud Stack. And uh, so some things are going to get uh, um, uh, far away from technical details and then we'll dive back into details at, uh, at other points. Um, <clears throat> but I've got a couple of questions for you and this is uh, this particular tutorial is best done interactively, so if you want to see something, uh, jump up and say it. If you want to, uh, uh, if you don't like um, uh, some content, feel free to disagree. Feel free to ask questions uh, and interject. Uh, no need to wait till the end. Um, so, but I'm curious, why are you here? Anyone want to volunteer? Yes. Okay. Anyone interested in doing something that's not test dev with, uh, let's call it a private cloud? Yeah. Okay. What, what are you interested in doing? Uh, apart from test, uh, test organization. Okay. Um, I'm actually surprised how many people want to do that and want to use a cloud to do it. Is anyone here who's been sent here to, because uh, uh, someone at their company has decided that they will have a cloud strategy and you have two weeks to implement it or something like that. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I gave a similar course um, in Los Angeles uh, a year or two ago and a guy from a very, very large defense contractor runs up to me and says, hey, I'm here and uh, I just want you to know that you're going to be setting the, um, uh, the strategy that very large defense contractor is going to use for their cloud strategy. And I said, what? He goes, well, my boss's boss's boss told me that we have to have a cloud strategy. We have to have it in two weeks. And um, I saw this particular training, so I'm here to take advantage of it. And um, I will be defining our strategy based upon what you tell me. And uh, I personally think that's doomed to failure. Um, if I'm the only source of truth that you take home, um, I'm flattered, but you're, you're, uh, you're woefully unprepared. Anyone using AWS today? Okay. Anyone using other public cloud providers? Okay. Um, I'm actually surprised. Uh, so for those of you who aren't, who say you're not using AWS, does that mean that no one in your company is using AWS? Wow. Um, one of the things I've found in the U.S. is that um, a lot of the companies are, um, say they're not using AWS or any other public cloud, but uh, when people are doing the expense reports, there's a massive outlay to uh, Amazon, and they can't imagine ordering that many books. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, in the U.S., my experience has been that if they have any decent size IT, or particularly if they're a tech-related company, uh, they are using AWS whether they know it or not. Uh, development managers are just expensing things. Um, <clears throat> so anyone doing private cloud today? Have I asked that? I don't see any hands. All right. So um, let's, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. So. I am a, a member of the Apache Software Foundation um, and uh, thankful that they elected me to that. Um, I am on the project management committee for Apache Cloud Stack. Uh, I was originally at cloud.com uh, before Citrix acquired cloud.com and then uh, Cloud Stack moved to the ASF shortly thereafter. Um, before that, I was an operations guy and I worked in uh, operations as a sysadmin or uh, team lead for about a decade, uh, and during that time I'd been contributing to a number of open source projects like Fedora, Zenos, Sahana, uh, and I currently work for Citrix in the open source business office. Um, uh, as a disclaimer, you will see plenty of things that are 
clearly not the Citrix corporate line. Uh, so these are my own views and none of theirs. So <clears throat> I want to explain, um, and perhaps this is, this is well known, but I think from an ops perspective, we often get um, a siloed view of the world. And so from a developer's perspective, um, here's what happens when they get, uh, when they get uh, a new project they've got to start working on. So they start the project and they go to your ticketing system, hopefully. Hopefully you have a ticketing system. And they file a ticket to get some resources. And then they wait. Um, if it's a really big project, they may be waiting a long time. Uh, if they, um, you know, let's say that they actually need new physical machines, it's that size of a project. Um, you know, you've got to get the PO approved, don't know how long that's going to take in your particular org. You've got um, to place the order, uh, and the vendor's going to have to fulfill the order. And typically, I see that ranging from four to six weeks, sometimes more. Um, but then you've got the server, and they come in, and everyone's happy, uh, except then they sit in the hallway, or they sit in, uh, in a server room waiting to be racked and cabled. So they have to get uh, all of those racked and cabled, and that's a different department, so another ticket. And then they all get cabled up, and you need network access which is IP addresses, um, uh, you're going to need, perhaps uh, if it's its own network, you're going to need routing and you'll need uh, firewall rules uh, written. That's a completely different department, maybe two or three different departments depending upon your size. So more tickets, more waiting. And then finally after that you get to go do things if they did everything correctly and you need no changes. And uh, so I've talked to a publishing company. Uh, they had, um, they already were using virtual machines pretty heavily. And their time to get a virtual machine deployed was three months. From the time a developer asked to the time it made it through all of the steps, getting firewall rules done, getting um, IP addresses handed out, and actually getting the virtual machine provisioned and then turned over to the, to the end user, three months. Um, I talked to a university who has uh, literally a different department that handles each one of these steps, and they were at uh, they were at eight weeks to get a virtual machine deployed to someone. Um, so you've essentially got this developer who's got potentially a great idea, uh, and he can't go get things done because he's waiting. So. Um, sum it up. Generally speaking, this is a generalization. What IT operations is providing is not what developers want. And by and large, what we see is that developers are realizing that you know, they can do some small scale stuff on their laptop. Uh, they can use things like LXC. They can use um, uh, some desktop virtualization tools and get some basic access on their own. But when they need larger scale than that, um, they simply have nowhere to go uh, inside the organization, so they go outside. Um, and it's really easy to use a micro instance that you can get for free on Amazon. It's really easy to plop down a credit card and then get that reimbursed because most of the time their um, their uh, manager's not going to say no to it. Um, and I tend to see a lot of development managers actually running group AWS accounts uh, and letting everyone in their team uh, do that because it is so much faster for them to get things done for the business uh, and they're able to meet their deadlines uh, without interference from operations. And I really do think it's not just, um, just the time to get things done, it actually is, uh, it, it comes down to being active interference. Uh, I, th I think that's partly an attitude problem um, that we in operations have adopted. Uh, I think going back to the time when we were the, uh, the priests that people had to make supplication to to run code on VAX machines, uh, we've gotten the idea that people are coming to us asking permission 
for us to get things done rather than providing a service. And, uh, and that we'll get to it when we get to it and, and they will have to live with it. And I do not think that that's the case, but that's a cultural discussion and we'll get, get away from that. So <clears throat> what we wanna do is get rid of the waiting. Uh, and what we specifically wanna do is we want to automate all of the things that, um, that don't need to be, uh, don't need to be dealt with by an individual, and there's a lot of that. Um, we want to have automated processes that we can easily enforce, that we can build rules around so that we're still comfortable with things, but at the same time uh, allow people to get things done uh, to, to as great a degree as possible. So that brings me to what is CloudStack. Um, from a project standpoint, uh, the project's at the Apache Software Foundation. It's a top-level project there. Um, it's an infrastructure as a service platform. Uh, started development in 2008. Uh, had some production deployments in 2009. Was released under the GPL v3 in 2010. Relicensed in 2012 uh, to the Apache Software license. Um, CloudStack differs from a lot of the other infrastructures of service platforms uh, in a couple of ways. First and foremost is focus. And the focus is different. If you look at some of the other, um, some of the other platforms out there, they have a very different focus. And uh, I will tell you what I think CloudStack's focus is, or at least what it is today. That may change at some point because uh, it is a living organization, living project. But uh, I think that the focus of CloudStack is to have an infrastructure as a service platform that just works, that is really easy to deploy, uh, because we want to focus on uh, rapid time to value. That's one of the reasons you want a cloud uh, platform in the first place, and we want to make sure that we're, we're going to be able to uh, allow you to do that. Um, so let me talk a little about the... Uh, the architecture so you understand how we're going to go about deploying this and rather than bore you with PowerPoint let me see if I'm still logged in So I want to real briefly uh, talk about how we group resources. Um, so we have this concept of a region, which you don't see up there, and a region is a collection of zones that are geographically close together. Uh, so we typically are talking um, 10 milliseconds or less is what we would really expect as far as latency. So you're, you're really talking about data centers in the same city, um, and you would assume that a zone itself is going to be a data center or maybe even uh, you are partitioning your data center into one or more zones. Um, but the regions will, um, if you have multiple regions, and we're just not advocating that you do this for a test dev cloud, but just to set some background, uh, they use an async message bus to communicate between the regions so that you can, uh, um, so that you don't have to deal uh, with uh, latency being an issue. You can, uh, latency is not that big a deal and you'll catch up uh, when you catch up. And essentially the zones have uh, some quasi independent management um, uh, of each other. They, uh, uh, the, each region will have its own set of uh, management servers and they'll communicate with each other uh, but you don't necessarily have to worry about uh, management server falling off the face of the earth and going away. Um, so the zone is where we're really going to focus most of our attention today, and it's what's most relevant uh, because you would have to have at least one zone. Um, <clears throat> and the zone is really where uh, you're going to be making networking decisions. So uh, at the zone level, Actually, let me see if I can. 
Uh, at the zone level, we are deciding what the underlying network model for the rest of, for everything underneath is going to be. Uh, and I, I don't want to delve, jump right into networking, but uh, essentially you're going to be deciding whether you're using SDN, uh, whether you're going to be using VLANs, or you're going to do uh, layer three uh, isolation uh, like Amazon security groups. Uh, so a zone is, is almost always within a single data center. It is a rather arbitrary distinction, uh, but because you're setting the network model, uh, it assumes that you're not going to span more than a single data center with a zone. The next level down are pods, and typically those are a rack or a row of racks. And um, uh, we're essentially assuming that there is a top of rack or end of row switch, and so the guest network within a pod is all going to be the same. Uh, everything inside that pod is going to have um, it's going to have access to um, the same guest networks. Below that are clusters, and this is the first time where we actually start enforcing, um, uh, enforcing some rules on things. Uh, so clusters are the lowest level uh, that we really are making any real decisions at. Uh, so when we make deployment decisions, we make them at the cluster level. Um, and so within a cluster, the hypervisors have to be the same. The hardware needs to be sort of the same, uh, at least as far as the hypervisor is concerned. Um, because we may decide to move uh, virtual machines around within a cluster to rebalance uh, load on machines. We may decide um, that because of a failure, we're going to restart a machine, uh, a restart an instance on another machine in the cluster. And so they need to have access to the same networking. Um, they need to probably have access to uh, the same CPU, or at least close enough that the hypervisor doesn't care and will migrate it cleanly. Um, that said, you can have multiple types of hypervisors in a pod. So you can have a cluster of KVM, a cluster of Zen server and a cluster of VMware, all living in the same pod and, uh, uh, and all running along being managed by the same uh, set of management servers. And of course we have the hosts that are in the, the, um, that are in the clusters. A couple of other elements that aren't necessarily um, uh, related to uh, the straight hierarchy we have a concept called secondary storage. Uh, and secondary storage is effectively our object store uh, that we use for storing, um, uh, we'll use that to store snapshots of running virtual machines. And we'll also use that to store the disk images for machines that we are going to deploy. Um, and so this is uh, storage that tends to not change a lot and its contents tend to be immutable. Um, and you can do this with, if you want the, the quick and dirty route, you can set up an NFS share and use that, or you can use Swift or S3, um, or anything that adheres to either Swift or S3 APIs. We also have primary storage. Um, and there's really three different flavors of primary storage. And primary storage is where we run the actual um, virtual machines. And uh, so there's three places, three types really. There's local storage. So you can have disks in the host themselves and provision virtual machines there. You need to understand that there are some implications like you're not gonna be able to live migrate a machine, which should be fine for a test dev environment. Um, you do get far better performance there, but um, uh, you know that, that's uh, or you tend to get far better performance uh, depending upon the alternative, I suppose. But uh, uh, it it also is a bit limiting in that your uh, it makes um, deployment decisions a little more difficult because you're you're now um, it injects some additional complexity where we used to only look at clusters. Uh, for deployment decisions. Now we have to go try that deployment uh, on an individual host. 
make sure it has enough storage. We also have shared storage uh, that is shared at the cluster level, and this has been the default um, since probably CloudStack 1.0 is we tied primary storage to the clusters uh, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, the hypervisors tended to have uh, a lot of uh, hypervisor-specific uh, desires, so uh, they wanted to have VMFS if you were running VMware. Uh, they wanted to do LVM atop iSCSI if you were running um, KVM. Uh, or they wanted, uh, they wanted um, to run raw block devices on iSCSI uh, with Zen server. And so <clears throat> that coupled with the fact that we wanted to limit the number of uh, units that could actually hit a single storage resource. So essentially trying to constrain the number of IOPS that would be demanded uh, on any storage resource. Uh, so we had that shared primary storage. That also meant that you could only live migrate uh, workloads within a cluster, which is a limiting factor. <clears throat> At the same time, storage is rapidly changing, and we're seeing uh, distributed storage really starting to pick up some traction. Uh, tools like Ceph, uh, particularly Ceph RBD, uh, Gluster has um, uh, some new uh, libvirt integration uh, where people are doing uh, essentially block devices uh, as a Gluster object. And uh, tools like Sheepdog, which have actually been around a little longer, uh, that are focused on providing uh, the types of storage that hypervisors really want to consume. And uh, being able to do that at scale which allows them to scale out their, uh, their ability to deal with multiple uh, hypervisors. So we've got uh, the final type of primary storage is zone-wide. And so you can have uh, storage that is accessible from anything within a zone, i.e. anything within a data center. Uh, this is also, I think, important because it's, uh, it's essentially the same scheme that Amazon uses for EBS. Um, and if you'll notice, EBS can be accessed from anywhere within uh, an availability zone within AWS. So if you need to mimic that, uh, that underlying architecture, you can. So that got us through uh, talking about kind of the, the structure of uh, the physical resources, right? Um, let's talk about networking for a minute. Um, See if I still am logged in. Yeah. So this is a super simple uh, network deployment for. Um, this is my personal CloudStack cloud that's uh, running in a colo in San Jose, I think, in California. Um, and essentially, I'm using VLANs for isolation. So. Um, Going back real quickly, um, we want to give people the ability to go get work done without shooting themselves, us, or anyone else in the foot in the process. And so that, uh, that means that we need to provide isolation to keep people um, isolated from each other. Uh, so if you set up a MySQL uh, test instance, it does not become the production MySQL instance. Uh, other people can't connect to it and uh, bring it down. And so uh, we have to assume isolation by default. And the question is, how are you going to provide that isolation? And there are really a, a number of options. Um, so the traditional answer to that is you use VLANs. Um, and people are really comfortable using VLANs uh, for network isolation today. Um, it's, a, it's a proven and tested technology. Um, it's got a couple of problems. It was, it was really created in the day before we could envision anything like the scales, uh, the economies of scale that are uh, being put into demands on, uh, on infrastructure today. Anyone know the maximum number of VLANs you can have in a single network? 4,000? 4, yeah. 
So you can have 4,096 theoretically. Um, the real problem is actually much, uh, much more sinister than that. Um, the overhead from, from routing and making routing and uh, decisions for 4,000 VLANs is incredibly expensive. Uh, and so the network vendors say, you know, no one, uh, no one in general enterprise needs to route more than 1,000 VLANs. Uh, and so typically for under six figures, um, US, you cannot get a switch that will do more than 1,000 VLANs at a time. And you're talking hundreds of thousands or millions uh, to uh, get something that will handle at line speed 4,000 VLANs. Which creates interesting other problems because that's also a very arbitrary number. Um, after you've invested that much money. Uh, so there's lots of people who are doing things like VXLAN, um, NV, uh, NVGRE, and uh, some of the other uh, SDN technologies that people have been pushing um, and you know, paying a billion dollars for Nasira, which uses STT. Um, we'll talk about those a little bit, um, but essentially, uh, you should walk away with the understanding that VLANs are expensive for you to consume and that if you're using VLANs for isolation, uh, you will run out, depending upon the size of your deployment, you will run out quickly um, because you're essentially going to need to provide a VLAN to every single, um, uh, we'll call it an account. So we, CloudStack has a concept of users' accounts Accounts are the lowest level of isolation, uh, and you could have multiple users within a single account. Um, but with uh, each account needing at least one, and if they need to build a multi-tier uh, uh, app and need to have multiple uh, levels of uh, networks, you've got uh, them consuming three, four, five, 10, 15. Uh, start multiplying that by the number of teams or accounts that you're gonna have and that balloons pretty quickly. <clears throat> so uh, this is not a new problem. Uh, Amazon clearly had this problem, and they developed something called security groups. Um, this is LinuxCon, so how many folks are familiar with EB tables? Okay, so uh, how many folks are familiar with IP tables, which is about to be deprecated? Um, so IP tables uh, has been around for a while, and uh, EB tables is its bridged brother. So um, when hypervisors create a networking device, uh, generally speaking, uh, they're doing that as a bridge. So they've got the physical connector uh, that you plug uh, a cable into. And um, that gets them that network access uh, into the box, right? So you plug a cable into it and get some, uh, the physical network into the box. And then they uh, create a bridge device and then uh, link those virtual interfaces that they're creating for the virtual machines into that bridge. Uh, and so in effect, that bridge device um, becomes a, a natural choke point or a point to make routing and firewall decisions, even though it's um, making layer three decisions rather than layer two that you would typically get with VLANs. That also gives you some scalability though because now instead of um, a single router or a layer three switch sitting at the, um, sitting at the top of a, um, a rack making all of those decisions, each machine, each physical machine uh, or hypervisor that's sitting in that rack has a bridge device that can be making decisions. So effectively you federated out your, uh, your routing decisions even though you've moved them up a layer. Uh, we've seen that work at massive scale, 50,000 of those bridge devices in a single deployment all being orchestrated um, by, uh, by CloudStack and essentially providing uh, that network isolation. Um, uh, and essentially what, what CloudStack's doing in that is it's ensuring that the state that is declared by CloudStack is actually enforced by the machines and it's going and saying, hey, 
this is the current state of uh, what you should have as far as uh, filtering. Is that what you have? And if not, update it. Uh, think of it as config management on the network plane. You also have uh, SDN options, and I'm not going to delve into those greatly. I don't think they have a ton of uh, applicability to uh, test dev environments. They certainly are out there. Um, today, uh, CloudStack supports Nasira NVP or NVS if you're using the latest uh, release. It supports, um, supports just using GRE tunnels. Um, if you want to just use Open vSwitch uh, and GRE tunnels, uh, it supports Stratosphere. Uh, it supports Mitocura's MitoNet. Um, there's just been added VXLAN support that is not in a release yet. Uh, and Contrail support has been, is uh, being very actively worked on. There's code in the repo, uh, but it's not been merged into a release branch yet. So um, there are plenty of SDN options if you're going to need that for wider use. So let me uh, figure out where my mouse is. So uh, a couple of other things that we'll talk about. Um, uh, really what CloudStack does is it's making, um, it's making orchestration and allocation decisions, right? So um, when I go to deploy an instance, we're, we're doing, uh, there are a number of things that we ask of the user to help us decide. And I apologize for this pain. Um, Real people who do work don't use this, but uh, it, it's helpful for illustrating things. So we tell them, we tell the end user the places they are allowed to deploy a virtual machine, right? You can do this in uh, any of the zones that you have access to. Now we may, res we may have zones that, that you don't have access to, but you, you get to choose that. That's one of the things we'll allow you to choose. Then we have templates that you can choose from, right? So you can choose what your disk image is going to be. Um, now, you'll notice that some of these have a hypervisor listing. Um, in reality, the end user doesn't get to choose the hypervisor. The disk image they choose may choose that for them, uh, but uh, they don't inherently get to make that choice. Uh, they get to decide what they want. They shouldn't care or worry about uh, what the hypervisor is. Those are merely uh, text fields that have been added. Uh, uh, so the end user doesn't know if they're running on bare metal, uh, if they're running on uh, a hypervisor, or if they're running in a container like LXC. Then we they get to decide what kind of resources. And again, this is something that uh, the operations folks are getting to present to them. Uh, they can define a number of uh, instances or a number of offerings for those instances uh, that, and again, these are all text fields. If, if we had any creativity, we would, uh, we would put something like how much CPU and how much RAM instead of medium instance and large instance. We also allow them to say uh, if they want additional storage in addition to the root disk, the root disk image. Did I click that? Let's go back. I clicked twice. Um, then they get to choose uh, a number of things about. Uh, uh, networks and so you'll notice that for the account that I'm on now there's only a single network. I could come here, add a new network, tell you the type, etc. Essentially, you know, if I'm allowed to create additional networks or uh, have uh, still networks left in my quota, I could certainly do that. Um, but uh, but I may be presented with a number of of um, of networks. 
all of those factors go into deciding where you're going to actually allocate the machine, right? Because if you choose a network that's only available uh, in a specific pod, that's going to have to be deployed there. Um, if you, there's also an entire science behind where do you want to allocate things. Um, and so CloudStack ships with a number of allocation um, algorithms. So uh, the default is first fit. So we see your request, we'll start looking for resources, and the first resource we find that meets all of the conditions you've put on it, we will allow you to, um, we will deploy it right there. Now what that means is that every time it starts searching the list of hosts, it tends to get those in the same order. So it will start filling up host first generally. Um, <clears throat> but there's also um, a number of other things. You can distribute that out. Uh, you can say, um, uh, you can say um, uh, there's a distributed per account. So I want, I'm worried about uh, a machine dying and I don't want all of your machines living on a single physical host. So I will spread out within an account machines as widely as possible. Uh, you also have um, uh, equalizing, which will essentially uh, spread the load out equally so that hosts are consumed equally. Um, and there are a number of others. You can also write your own if, you've, uh, if you need to apply rules of affinity or non-affinity. You, know, you want to have um, two nodes that are processing the same data close by so that they can pass that data back and forth easily uh, or you know a number of other rules. Maybe you have um, licensing for Microsoft or Oracle products that say you can run as many instances you want on uh, on n number of physical nodes and so you want to keep all of those on the same physical nodes. Uh, so really when it comes down to it CloudStack is about creating a set of um, uh, of rules around an allocation and it's got some defaults so that you don't have to do this the first time out but allowing you to set uh, parameters whereby people can go and automatically deploy things and do things in the same same manner um, and so we're going kind of backwards here we've, we've talked about the architecture and we talk about what CloudStack does at a really high level um, uh, let's talk about kind of the uh, the layout of how CloudStack does that. So we obviously have hypervisors and we group those in clusters and pods and zones uh, and then regions. Um, but the rest of that story is that we have stateless management servers uh, and which is what you're seeing here is one of those management servers. Um, it uh, It'll run on just about anything because it's all Java, but uh, we generally assume Linux uh, is what you're running it on. Um, they're stateless. They will auto-balance uh, uh, the work between themselves if you've got multiple of them. Uh, they will essentially um, uh, pick up work uh, if one of them dies. So you can have four or five of these stood up and um, it'll automatically load balance all of the work between them. <clears throat> um, by the way, four or five is overkill. Uh, the largest deployment that I know of is um, almost at 50,000 physical hosts under a single plane of management and they have a grand total of four management servers in place. Um, so I keep saying that these are stateless or at least quasi stateless um, uh, management servers. State is stored in a uh, MySQL database and um, so you've got, uh, you've got the data store on the back end that you're communicating to. Um, that sounds pretty monolithic, and it is uh, from that perspective. You've got sing essentially a single orchestration engine uh, that is making allocation decisions, et cetera. Even if you've got multiple of them, uh, they're, they're effectively all doing the work. Um, we have a couple of other things that do some of those services, um, some of the other services within a cloud. So we have, um, by default anyway, we ship a, uh, a virtual router. And the router offers DHCP, DNS, um, routing firewall, NAT, 
um, load balancing, and a couple of other um, network services that you can choose to turn on or off uh, as a service offering to folks. And uh, depending upon your network model, you'll have um, one per pod or one per account. Um, so if you're using VLANs, each customer ends up getting their own uh, virtual router. They don't get to access it. Uh, they can interact with CloudStack to, uh, to make changes uh, to the configuration, uh, but, um, uh, but they don't actually get to, to deal with that, but it is dedicated to them. And so it will automatically spin up uh, a new router when a new network is created. Um, uh, or when it is appropriate. So you may have multiple networks that are backed by a single virtual router. Um, we also have a couple of other um, pieces of functionality. So uh, you hate to have to do this just like you would hate to have to sign into DRAC on a Dell machine or ILO on, um, uh, ILO on HP or LOM on, on old Sun hardware, but, oh, and it brought it up over here. I'm not seeing it. But we essentially have a remote console um, that uh, will allow you, if your networking is hosed and you can't get in any other way, to connect to the console of the virtual machine. And so we have, because we don't want to allow you direct access to the hypervisor, we have this, um, uh, we have essentially an Ajax proxy uh, to either VNC, and we just recently got uh, a code drop to add RDP in as well. Uh, so you can connect uh, to the console of the machine from the hypervisor, and um, it's awful just like track or Loam is. Uh, you can see how slow the response is and how you would hate to use this every day. But worst case scenario, this will work. Uh, this is also, especially if you're using something more than a console, this also gets a little uh, expensive in terms of proxying that. So we have this um, console proxy VM, and it will uh, add additional nodes on demand. Um, and essentially so that if, uh, if there are a ton of people accessing the consoles, it'll spin up more. And when that uh, load dies down, it'll drop back to just a single console proxy VM. We do something similar with the secondary storage VM, which deals with aging out, um, aging out uh, your um, uh, your snapshots, grabbing snapshots from the running hypervisors, uh, as well as deploying uh, templates and allowing you to to download snapshots or templates from it. So. Um, I don't know that I intended to go as deeply into what CloudStack is as I have done. Before I depart, though, do you have any questions about what CloudStack is or how it does it before we go into actually using it to build a test dev cloud? Can you say that the management server runs um, on Java, essentially? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so CloudStack um, interacts with a couple of different things. We will interact with vCenter, um, and that assumes that you'll have VMware nodes behind it. Uh, we will interact with Zen Server's API, which assumes that you're going to have Zen Server probably running on bare metal. Um, we'll interact with libvirt uh, for KVM and LXC, um, which probably assumes that you're running um, bare metal for the KVM nodes, um, probably running KVM or bare metal for the LXC nodes too, right, in, in real world. Um, but we don't really care because we're, we're largely trying to do everything we can to interact with APIs rather than to interact with, um, you know, command line uh, as much as we can. So, uh, that means that uh, we don't really care what the hosts are as long as we can talk to them in a sane manner. 
We do do some version checking. Um, so if you're not on, if you're trying to run uh, a really old version of vCenter or a really old version of uh, Zen Server or libvirt, um, we'll fail, won't even connect and, and add the host. But really, we don't care what the hosts are. Um, uh, as long as they, uh, we do do some checks for uh, ensuring that you can do hardware vert on the, on the host, uh, especially for KVM and Zen Server. Aside from that, we don't, we don't really care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right, let me see if I, so, yes. Uh, so guest networks are zone wide. Uh, actually, that's not true. Guest networks are pod wide. Networking uh, in general is zone wide. So um, we would assume that uh, your pod has, your pod may have access only to um, specific guest networks. Those could be larger. But uh, the pod is going to assume that everything in the pod has access to the same guest network. It may be that everything in the zone does, but that's not a guarantee. And certainly the, the network doesn't, um, uh, portable IP stuff notwithstanding, um, uh, we assume that, uh, uh, that networks are not uh, crossing a zone boundary. All right, so let me see if I can jump back into this slideshow real quickly. All right, so let's talk about what a self service dev test cloud looks like. Um, I think self-service is mandatory. Uh, it's certainly in uh, most of the definitions of around cloud. Um, and I don't think you can get away uh, from allowing people to provision their own things. If you're just looking for a shiny new toy, uh, there are much better projects to tackle than an infrastructure as a service uh, deployment. Um, <clears throat> the uh, We'll talk a little bit about setting boundaries in a bit because I know that, uh, that allowing people to, to self-service is also scary. Um, and as an ops guy, I, um, for a number of years, um, including up to about 12 months before I started working on a cloud project, I was vehemently against cloud computing because um, developers don't understand and don't care about the nuances of running an operations. Um, environment. So um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how we deal with self-service. Um, I think you have to have um, usage measurement because when people think that there's unlimited uh, resources, they will consume them uh, in, uh, as if it really were unlimited and didn't cost anything. We talked about isolating a little bit earlier. I think that your dev test environment must isolate. Uh, CloudStack will allow you to uh, share networks with everyone. I think it's, uh, generally speaking, a mistake to do that. Um, I also take um, the standpoint that, especially with dev test, but with cloud in general, that it should be commodity. If you are having to pay inordinate amounts for specific technology, um, I think that you're, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, there would have to be a really compelling reason to pay more than than, uh, than the cheap price. Um, and I, this final thing is uh, dev test clouds never stay dev test. Um, uh, my favorite, uh, there's a, a movie company in, uh, in California who did a, uh, a proof of concept with CloudStack. They set it up, they started using it, they liked it. They, they decided that they were going to uh, deploy CloudStack in production. And uh, so they got ready to tear down the environment. They had learned a few things and wanted to improve uh, some of their choices. And they started to tear it down. They sent a notice out. And people said, wait, wait, you can't do that. We have production workloads running there. Do you realize the homepage of our movie studio is running on your new cloud along with all of our interactive properties? 
and um, the cloud had been up for 90 days uh, as a proof of concept. So um, be very cautious about uh, the fact that we tend to treat test dev like a redheaded stepchild and, and we don't monitor it and we don't, uh, we don't do uh, all the things we would for a real production uh, environment. Uh, because when developers find out that it's easy, they'll bypass all of the other things and, and try and deploy to production. Um, which is really uh, an encouragement that you need to be uh, communicating frequently with the folks who are using your services. So, <coughs> um, I showed you deploying a, a virtual machine. And uh, I do not believe that provisioning manually um, specifically not provisioning by a sysadmin adds value. Um, it should be completely automated. Uh, and this is not, should not be news to anyone in ops. Uh, we've had Pixie uh, installers with Kickstart or Jumpstart uh, or RIS for, uh, for decades. And there's no reason for anyone to be carrying around CD-ROMs or USB drives to install things. When you're talking, though, about um, about letting people who are traditionally not ops folks, uh, self-service takes on some, some new meaning and automation takes on new meaning. Um, do you mean letting them use the UI? Um, like I stepped through the, the six steps to provisioning a VM in the cloud stack UI? Boy, I certainly hope not. That's painful if you have to do it more than once. Um, who wants to click, even if you're using all default answers, who wants to click six times? Um, that's, uh, that's awful. Um, no one who does real work does it this way. So, uh, I wouldn't let your users either. Um, maybe they want to, uh, interact with an API. They've got some tools. Um, so CloudStack has a dedicated command line, um, interface called CloudMonkey. That's on PyPy, so you can install it from PyPy. Um, that will allow you to uh, have essentially tab completion for deploying, uh, for doing anything with CloudStack. Um, uh, CloudStack also has its own native API uh, that you can interact with directly or you can use abstraction libraries. Um, CloudStack also maintains uh, EC2 compatibility, so we have a separate API interface uh, if you want to use tools like Bodo or Yuka tools um, or even Amazon's EC2 tools, although that violates their, uh, the license around the EC2 tools itself, uh, you can interact with the uh, uh, CloudStack EC2 endpoint and, uh, and use the same tools for doing that. Um, I think if you have really sophisticated developers, uh, that's, any of those options are probably realistic. Um, uh, I don't know that it's for everyone. So I think there's also config management deployment. Uh, anyone in here not using config management? Awesome. Okay. Anyone just afraid to raise their hand? Um, uh, so config management is, is well entrenched today. Um, and I'll show you my favorite tool. And I apologize for this being so small. I just didn't know how to get everything in there uh, easily otherwise. So <clears throat> I really should have done some highlighting here. So up here we have the name. This is a Hadoop cluster definition. This is, uh, this is for a tool called Knife Cloud Stack. Uh, how many folks are familiar with Chef and Knife? Okay, so for those of you who aren't, uh, Chef is a config management tool. Uh, from ops code and knife is uh, essentially their pro provisioning tool uh, or at least that's what we're using it for here. Uh, knife CloudStack has uh, a unique ability to define uh, an entire application stack uh, and then call that. So um, uh, this is just setting the name, a description, a version number uh, so you can keep, a, uh, keep it versioned and update. Uh, you can set environment but the real meat of this is when you get down to the servers. So we have, uh, we have Zookeeper nodes here, and we've defined that there will be three of them in this application stack, A, B, and C. 
We've defined what the base disk image is going to be, which is rel 56 base, and you'll notice that we use that throughout in all three of these definitions. The service offering, uh, which again is the CPU and RAM that it's going to have. Port rules are the firewall rules that we're adjusting to open. Um, and then we're essentially defining the roles that it's going to have. So this is going to be a member of cluster A and it's going to be a zookeeper server within that cluster. So that's just defined three nodes for us. Then we're going to have a Hadoop master. Um, you'll notice the service offering is different. Uh, you'll also notice that this has a, a networks field. So um, that gets you app, uh, app and storage networks. Uh, and so it's adding both of those. You'll see we're also opening up three, uh, three different sets of ports. And then finally, we're coming down and uh, having the worker nodes, uh, which again are using RHEL 5.6, same service offering, um, port rules. You'll notice we didn't define any, um, any networks, which means there's, it's going to consume the default network. So this is something that operations defined as this is what a Hadoop cluster looks like in our environment. A developer sits there and says knife CS stack uh, Hadoop cluster A deploy. And it deploys all of these machines uh, with the firewalls rules applied, uh, access to the proper networks, and um, uh, and then links them all together as that cluster. Um, so rather than, you know, them provisioning a... This really does not want to stay on. Rather than them provisioning a um, uh, raw virtual machines and then having to install Hadoop and then having to configure network access, um, the ops folks said, hey, this is how we define a Hadoop cluster in our environment. Go use this. Uh, and it's a single command line for the developer to deploy an entire cluster. Completely configured and ready to go. Uh, and the folks at edmunds.com wrote that tool. Um, and, uh, and I've been very pleased with it. You can do similar things like this with um, uh, salt stack. Um, uh, there's folks who are working on it for Ansible, and uh, there's similar stuff for uh, Puppet. There are native types and providers for uh, Puppet resource or for CloudStack resources with Puppet as well. Um, what I tend to see, this is again perfectly viable and, and decent. What I tend to see, though, uh, most often is people have a tool, and this ranges from a button uh, on a web page. Uh, to something like this. Uh, this is uh, Cloudcat, uh, written by the folks at Cloudera. Um, and this is essentially how their developers are deploying uh, CloudStack um, <coughs> in their, um, are deploying CloudStack instances in their environment. Um, and, you know, they get to set a few things. There are defaults for virtually everything. And, you know, they can say, spin me up 15 nodes, and I'll deal with them. Uh, the only other thing that I tend to see is uh, I see a lot of people uh, doing reservation engines. Um, so a developer, particularly in a dev test cloud, should not be running something forever. Uh, it should have a limited lifespan. And so essentially um, creating a record of how long you promise to, uh, to use and be, then be done with it uh, and then harvesting based upon those records uh, is, uh, is something I see pretty commonly as well. So how many folks are familiar with Jevons Paradox? All right, so uh, before you go to Wikipedia, Jevons Paradox says uh, essentially that as we become more efficient, that demand for what we just made efficient goes up. Um, uh, because, uh, because we can produce uh, electricity cheaper, uh, we will consume more of it. Um, when gas, when petrol is, uh, is less expensive, people tend to drive farther. Um, and so when, uh, <clears throat> when it is much easier to consume compu computing resources, people will. Uh, and on top of that, because they see no direct 
uh, cost, people are often leaving, uh, uh, leaving AWS instances running uh, ad infinitum. Um, and I say that as someone who's had you know, $2,000 a month AWS bills on my personal AWS account because other people in my team spun up instances, left them running. I was getting no direct benefit and just being charged for it. So uh, there's plenty of waste that typically is round and you need to either have a chargeback or a showback mechanism. Um, and so CloudStack will actively calculate um, your usage and it will do that not just for allocated resources, but it will actually look at consumed. So you may have a five terabyte disk allocated, but uh, a 50, 50 gigabytes of that is actually consumed and it will track both of those things. Uh, uh, same thing with CPU. You may have um, four vCPUs consumed or allocated and only consuming one of them at 100%. Uh, and so you can actually look at the things that are going unused uh, that are still consuming your allocation. Um, and you would be shocked at how uh, effectively that, um, that cordons off a lot of waste because uh, uh, engineering manager sees that they're responsible for 25% of the compute bill and, um, and things start to uh, be analyzed. Um, <clears throat> so I think you also need to deal with monitoring. Um, I do not think, and, and I think Tom Lemoncelli is the, the guy who first said this, uh, that you cannot offer a service if you do not monitor it. Uh, it simply is not a service if you, if you don't care enough to monitor it. At the same time, I think from an operation standpoint, uh, why monitor it? It's dev test. Uh, we've already established that uh, we don't care enough and it may go away. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that said, uh, even though we are the high and mighty operations folks, developers are still important and you should care a little bit about their infrastructure. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think at a minimum monitoring CloudStack because I think it will become uh, an important tool or monitoring whatever your cloud platform is, is a reasonable start. Um, I don't think I would necessarily monitor instances. Um, you know, but uh, the more important question is how are you going to deal with ephemeral instances? So think about what we typically do. How many folks are using Nagios for, for monitoring? Um, so typically what we do is we define what we're going to monitor on a node. And um, that means that when we spin it up, we will say, all right, HTTPD is running here. We will monitor that. Uh, MySQL is running on this other box. We have a different set of checks that we will run for that. What about if you don't know when a host comes up or down? What happens when uh, it goes up or a developer kills it? Does someone get woken up in the middle of the night? That's a question that you have to, uh, you know, is that worth alerting on? I would argue that it's not, but you also have to be able to monitor those resources to some degree. So I think you need to be choosing commodity storage. Um, if I were designing a, a test dev uh, environment today and I wasn't already paying NetApp or EMC or some other storage vendor large sums of money, I would certainly be doing local storage. Yes? So CloudStack has, um, will send you out SNMP traps. You can also do JMX uh, for monitoring CloudStack itself. Uh, there's a JMX port that allows you to do a ton of things. Um, there are monitoring packages or monitoring plugins for Nagios, uh, Xenos, Zabbix, and Nimsoft uh, that actually are making API calls into CloudStack for uh, monitoring things like host availability and um, uh, and uh, you know amount of storage capacity left, etc., for your entire environment. Um, uh, so I think those are that's that's what's being done today. Um, much to my chagrin, CloudStack doesn't have um, an SNMP interface you can query. It is trap only right now. Uh, so it'll send out alerts, but it won't won't do anything past that. Um, 
and uh, we've really struggled to try and keep CloudStack from becoming a monitoring environment itself. Um, uh, it does some very limited monitoring of, uh, of the storage resources you consume, the networking resources you consume, um, but really it's checking to see if it has uh, space to continue allocating on those resources. We'll also check hosts um, if you've marked it as highly available. Uh, we'll, we'll check those hosts to, make, to see if they are still up. And uh, if they're not, we'll restart them on a different host. But uh, it's really poor man's HA. I mean, it's, it's not HA in the sense of you know, uh, Core Sync or Linux HA by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's, uh, uh, I tried to pitch this long before, uh, back when we were at cloud.com. Uh, of calling it uh, really fast mean time to recovery rather than HA, but they apparently didn't like that and went put it on a marketing slick. So, um, uh, from a monitoring perspective, uh, you can grab the traps, uh, you can um, do JMX monitoring if you're if you're a big Java shop, you're familiar with that already, and um, uh, you can also there's a number of plugins you could emulate them with essentially any package because it's just making API calls to grab and parse the information. So when I'm, if I'm assembling a, uh, a um, dev test cloud, I personally think that the best value is local storage. Because <clears throat> I'm, I'm essentially saying that I don't need something that has the attributes of shared storage. I need it to uh, be relatively fast. Uh, and local storage tends to be uh, generally the fastest. Um, it's not resilient. I know that if it dies, it goes away. And I have hopefully set expectations that all of these uh, should be treated as ephemeral, even if they're not. Um, so you don't get failover. If the host dies, all that storage goes with it. But, uh, uh, but it's the best mix of cheap and performance and able to get you started right away. So I talked a lot about kind of the networking strategy. If I were defining a network for a dev test cloud, I would be uh, choosing layer three isolation or what Amazon calls security groups. I think that uh, you could do VLANs on a really small scale, um, but I don't honestly think it's worth it. Uh, I don't think, uh, particularly in a dev test cloud, that there's anything that you miss out on um, by using layer three isolation, and you can use cheap and dirty uh, uh, switches. I mean, switches that aren't even capable of VLANs uh, if you're using security groups. Um, CloudStack, and I didn't really talk about this, CloudStack will manage um, physical hardware or even virtual representations of physical hardware. So if you've got an uh, F5 load balancer or Juniper SRX or um, uh, Cisco has a number of uh, virtual network appliances that you can use with VMware. Um, you can have CloudStack interact with all of those. Uh, I think it's a waste of your money um, for the dev test scope. Um, I do not think, and I think for a lot of other purposes, I think you really have to get uh, into a very niche uh, deployment to, to justify those. So. The virtual routers will do DHCP, DNS, load balancing, port forwarding, NAT, uh, and uh, a number of services you probably will never need. Uh, let them do the work. Uh, a virtual machine is as commodity as you can get. Um, <clears throat> and this also allows you to, uh, depending upon your network uh, deployment, allows you to scale it pretty easily. Adding another virtual router is as easy as deploying another um, another virtual machine. Uh, so I, I, would, uh, I would use cheap networking gear, uh, and I would use layer three isolation as my network model when setting this up. So then when, um, then when going for hypervisor, I pick a choice here. Um, that is my personal choice. You should use whatever you're comfortable with because you'll already have the expertise. Um, use what, what everyone knows. If you're a VMware shop, 
you should, you should certainly use VMware. You're already paying the VMware tax. There's zero benefit to switching. Um, and for, from a dev test perspective, there's zero benefit to using anything else, at least at a small scale. Use what you know. Um, from a dev test perspective, they are, they are effectively equal. Uh, you need the ability to turn a virtual machine on, off, ensure it gets connected to a, um, a network and it has access to storage, and every hypervisor out there does a great job of that. If you are, um, if you are incredibly resource constrained or you're doing this at a really large scale, um, there are two different answers. Uh, I think KVM, if you come in knowing nothing, um, you're going to be running Linux, I presume, anyway. Uh, so I think KVM is the easiest to pick up if you don't know hypervisors at all. Um, and it's the easiest to get going and running uh, really quickly. Uh, to eat the most out of things, I think uh, Zen Server probably gets you closer to that. And I think that's why you see uh, Google and Amazon, uh, both of their clouds are running Zen-based hypervisors. Uh, I think they allow you to tweak things. I think the overhead for doing so uh, is a lot higher. Um, but, uh, but if you're doing this at massive scale or you've got to eke every bit out of a performance out of it or you need to, um, you need to pass through virtual GPUs for, um, for uh, actually using the GPUs for uh, calculations, yeah, there's, there's probably some advantages in Zen. Uh, but for general dev test purposes, uh, use what you know. Uh, if you're really resource constrained, uh, LXC is far more efficient than any of the real hypervisors. And LXC is uh, just a container. Uh, and uh, I think LXC is compelling for other reasons from a dev test environment. The entire uh, container aspect of being able to define the environment um, I think makes it easier on folks. But if you're not already using LXC or Docker or something similar, uh, it may not be worth the overhead of learning. Anyone find my choice of KVM offensive? Okay, I have no fellow Citrix employees in the audience. Um, so Citrix uh, does a lot of work on Zen and uh, I catch flack for this occasionally. So, <coughs> um, from an ops standpoint, we, we like the idea of not having to do menial tasks and being able to automate them. We dislike the idea of people having uh, essentially uh, the authority to go and do things that we consider dangerous for them to do. Um, so we have a couple of constructs and, and every cloud management uh, platform you consider should have similar things. You can limit the amount of resources that people can deploy you can limit where they can deploy resources, um, and uh, you can create a number of rules around that. Um, anyone know what the default limit is for number of instances on AWS when you sign up for a new account? 20, you can spin up 20 VMs. Um, the last, last estimates I heard were that uh, Amazon had well into six figures of physical hosts which I would be willing to bet is larger than any of the uh, cloud deployments that any of us will be interacting with. And I think Amazon does it for a couple of reasons. Um, I don't think that they necessarily have the scale problem, but I think they, they are um, concerned about it somewhat. Um, they're worried about fraud, and they're also worried about um, uh, inadvertent uh, escalation of bills that people will end up not being able to pay. So <clears throat> essentially uh, um, with when you're talking about uh, deploying um, all of these uh, resources and maybe you set something that auto scales uh, based on load. Spinning up 20, well that's that's a heady use spinning up 200 or 2,000 uh, because it ran away from you without you knowing, uh, that's a lot more serious. 
So when even the, the largest uh, public cloud in the world has uh, some default limits, I think it's uh, not unreasonable for you to have the same. So um, set some defaults. Um, there are ways of getting around, you know, if you've got a big project and, and need to have multiple people uh, sharing resources uh, outside of the account system, uh, you, can, you can set up projects and allocate resources directly to that to get yourself around, um, around quotas. And the quotas will ensure that 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, you stay out of people's way and allow them to work with insane, uh, insane restrictions. And those people that, uh, that are going to need to consume lots and lots need to come talk to you. So it's a nice safety valve. Um, and that allows you to deal with um, uh, setting, you know, you may set, it may be sane in your environment to say that people get no public IP addresses because you don't want them exposing things. Um, and uh, allows you to still make exceptions and allow uh, different groups to do other things. So I've told you my consideration. I want to talk about how you actually go about deploying uh, CloudStack. Um, so what I won't talk about is the boring stuff. Uh, CloudStack has Yum and app repos. So if you're using um, Ubuntu, Debian, or uh, CentOS, you can deploy easily. Um, it's two lines to build your own packages if you want to run it on something other than CentOS or Ubuntu or Ubuntu-like um, distributions. Uh, so that really is the easy part, right? Um, so how do you actually go about and deploy CloudStack uh, in an environment? And uh, that's actually a couple of things. Uh, so uh, you're obviously going to install the packages. Um, that's, again, the boring part we don't want to talk about. You have the things that, uh, uh, that you also have to take care of. You've got to decide network model. And invariably, you will get it wrong the first time you try and deploy it. Um, and I don't have any advice other than to try different things, figure out what you actually need out of a network uh, model, whether that's, you know, you're going to use VLANs, uh, for whatever reason, you're going to use security groups. Uh, you're going to try some cool new SDN stuff. Um, and even then, once you made the network model choice, <coughs> figuring out how to actually put that onto the, um, uh, meld that with the physical infrastructure can be challenging. So let's talk about, um, we, we focused a lot of time on network choices for uh, for the guests. So we've talked about VLAN security groups and, and SDN. Um, there's, a, there's also a management network. Um, and real quickly, I'll... I don't know if it's going to let me stay in or not. Well, maybe. No. Nope. Um, so we also have a couple of other, um, we have a couple of other, uh, networks that you have to worry about in the process. So. You probably have a public network if you're going to allow people to expose their work to uh, the internet. Um, that's probably going to be a different layer two network, even if you're using security groups. Um, and uh, the bulk of what we've talked about thus far is the guest network. Um, so while you can probably consolidate, you've also got to worry about a management network and that management network is going to um, uh, be traffic between the hypervisors and the management server uh, and potentially the management server and secondary storage uh, as well as hypervisors and secondary storage. You can eliminate a little bit of that and have a separate storage network and I, I hate the term that we call this a storage network. 
uh, that is a secondary storage network. So essentially it's taking um, the disk templates and snapshots and giving their storage and, and migration a dedicated network so you're not clogging your guest networks with traffic. Um, storage and management will all be the same network uh, if you don't put a, a dedicated uh, storage network in place. <coughs> and then completely separate to this, you can have a dedicated storage network for primary storage. Um, and that, uh, uh, that really is outside the scope of CloudStack and it should be set up so that the routing table sees that as the local route storage and it will consume the, that uh, particular network. But that's really outside the scope of, of CloudStack itself uh, and is more host configuration. Um, and uh, so you've got potentially all of these networks uh, and you've got to really figure out are these real physical interfaces? Um, is it worth having a dedicated um, primary storage network uh, interface? Should that be a VIF, etc.? cetera? So um, uh, network setup is the bane of every uh, cloud deployment regardless of platform. Uh, it is the most complicated uh, piece of the puzzle, I think. <coughs> um, but I'll essentially, I'm going to walk you through the choices that you have to make uh, when you're setting up, and, and really you're talking about setting up your a zone, right? So when you install, uh, the management server's installed automatically. Uh, you'll tell it what database server to point to, and it will create the database, and, um, and then you'll tell it to start the management server. And then we're really coming down to uh, uh, to setting up a zone, right? So everything after that is zone setup. So let's walk through what zone setup looks like. Uh, and so we have um, this network choice. And so basic is uh, layer three isolation, advanced is everything else. So if you wanna do VLANs or SDN or security groups with VLANs, it's gonna be an advanced network. Uh, and basic is either Layer 3 isolation or no isolation at all. So we'll walk through. Um, we're setting up uh, essentially uh, defining a lot of text fields. Name, uh, setting up uh, external DNS and internal DNS. So internal DNS is the DNS that will, um, that will point to local resources, so things that you're not uh, publishing public DNS for. I typically, because of the way, I, I do not use any internal DNS names at all. Uh, so I list internal DNS as public DNS and go from there. You'll see it asks what hypervisor you want. And I told you earlier that hypervisors are, um, <coughs> are uh, cluster specific. So why is it asking you for a hypervisor? Um, essentially, it's going to start creating some jobs as soon as we create the zone, and it's going to uh, it's going to need to know what hypervisor we're going to have first, so it can deploy some of those system VMs, uh, so the um, virtual routers and and other things. So. Let's see. We will set up a zone here. We will be grateful and use Google's DNS service. Um, I'm going to choose KVM. Now you'll notice that LXC wasn't in the list, and uh, you cannot deploy. LXC is a primary zone because it does not have a system VM. So if you're using LXC, you have to run it in addition. Well, so we have, uh, we have something called Quick Cloud, which runs the system VM services on the management server if you're using, doing really small scale stuff or just prototyping. Um, but generally speaking, you need a KVM Zen server or VMware cluster um, 
running, and that's true for both bare metal and LXC. You'll need uh, you'll need at least a helper cluster uh, of something else to to run those system VMs for you. Then we get to um, uh, network offering, and so um, this is this is the option under basic, um, and there are some others uh, under advanced. Uh, the default shared network offering with security group service is um, uh, is essentially layer three isolation. You can say default shared network offering without security groups, and uh, and that will give you a flat layer two network that everyone shares and everyone can see the traffic on. Um, I think that's I think that's generally a bad idea, but you can do it. And uh, you can also use NetScaler hardware as well. So we're going to use security groups and we'll say that our, uh, our default network domain. We can also say if this is going to be a public zone or not. Um, so you can create dedicated zones for specific purposes or specific users. And we see a lot of, uh, a lot of government users who uh, create uh, dedicated zones for different uh, security levels. Um, and you can also define whether you're going to have local storage in, uh, in the zone or not. So we'll say this is public. All right. So you can, uh, this is where you're essentially um, uh, setting up your, uh, your networking and you can add that secondary storage network and you can edit the details of uh, guest network by essentially telling it uh, what the interface name is in KVM uh, or uh, the label that you would have in Zen server or the, uh, the vSwitch ID in VMware. So we've essentially, we're done with zone setup at this point. So let's, um, we're gonna, we will create our first pod, which again is, tempor is generally a rack or row of racks. And we will say that the reserved system gateway. So this is, um, <clears throat> This is uh, essentially the management network that's going to be used uh, in that pod. This is the gateway for, I'm sorry, the yes network in that pod. This is the gateway that's going to exist. We are, we are assuming that the underlying guest network has a gateway out. Um, I really dislike the fact that they call it reserved and for that particular field and this one and the net mask. And we'll say that this is um, slash 23 and then we have um, so you need to have um, a number of IPs internally um, that are going to be reserved and dedicated to um, that are going to be reserved and dedicated to uh, to CloudStack's internal use so um, think about uh, the system VMs they're going to have a address on this guest network and CloudStack wants you to reserve a section. So that also means that, uh, so I told it that net mask, that entire slash 23 um, CloudStack is going to assume is its own. Um, you can do some partitioning of that uh, uh, via the API, but in this setup dialogue, uh, if you hand it a network, it assumes that it has rights to everything except for that gateway and uh, and it will also hold separately the, um, the system IP addresses. So um, the install guide says that you should reserve 10. I don't know where they came up with the number. Uh, 10 is a stupid number uh, for some environments. Um, if you're using um, VLANs, it should be 10 plus the number of VLANs that you plan on consuming. Um, if you're using uh, layer three isolation, 10 is probably overkill and you can get by with five. 
if you're using um, if you're using um, SDN, it depends on the SDN technology you're using. Uh, some of those will consume more uh, more IPs for system resources than others. But we're going to do ten to two. You'll notice this is still in my net mask. So I've said uh, 10 to a 1, 1, 2 to 12 is my, uh, is my system IP range. Uh, so these are going to be where the, the system VMs get there. All right, so now I've got to, uh, to define guests. In this particular case, because I'm doing because I'm doing uh, basic networking, I will be using the same exact um, uh, network definition. And I, I will not be able to use 2 through 12 uh, as, uh, as part of my guest network. Uh, guest and, uh, and system networks and basic networks are exactly the same. And I'm advocating that you use this, A, because it's simple or it's simpler. If you're using VLANs for isolation, you can define a completely different um, uh, network um, from an IP perspective uh, to be used for each one of those VLANs. So um, you could have something completely different here, um, but we're doing basic, so it's all going to be uh, helps to use periods. Right, so um, and so it's already selected that I'm going to be choosing the KVM hypervisor. We're done with pod setup at this point. We're working on clusters now, um, and so the cluster name KVM forum was here, and I can actually spell forum. Um, so we'll name the cluster name KVM Forum. And now it's going to ask me to provide a host, which I don't have. Um, and after you go through all of this, and actually we'll go ahead and say host name is foo, username is root, password is password. Um, host tags are something that allow you to set uh, individual hosts off. So um, if you need to make additional allocating decisions, you can say um, these are hosts with SSDs, these are hosts with really slow IDE drives. Um, you could also uh, uh, tag them, say these are um, hosts that I want to allow um, personal information about individuals to reside on as opposed to the rest of the workloads. Generally, in a uh, dev test environment, you don't need to worry about it, and you certainly don't have to fill it out by default. So it's going to go and try. So it's going to end up failing. I'm trying to think of what that is. Um, So it's looking for a secondary storage resource, and the fault is NFS. You can also use object storage. I dropped the mic again. So now it's going to try and launch the zone. That is essentially all that there is to setting up CloudStack. I mean, obviously, you should have also set up your NFS server or object store to deal with secondary storage, and you should have. Uh, you should have um, uh, actually had resources, a KVM node here in Edinburgh, but um, it will try, it will fail, it will create, go through and create the networks and, 
and everything else, which are purely software constructs at this, at this stage in the game. Um, but it's also checking through each of these steps to make sure that you've got something that will actually work uh, when it comes up. Um, so um, it's going to go through a number of things. Check your um, uh, check all of the configuration values, and then if you've made any errors, you can go back and fix the errors. And it thinks that I have a problem. We'll make it. Yes. But that means if you do make a config um, error, it's really easy to go fix it. And you'll see that. Um, that I fixed the error, something went wrong adding the host because that host doesn't actually exist here, um, which we expected. Um, and that's about it. At the same time, I don't want to trivialize setting up a, a cloud platform because it can be quite, uh, quite painful, um, especially as you try and do more complex things. You'll notice I did not uh, change the defaults for network configuration, and you can do many more complex things and may need to do more complex things to deal with compliance issues uh, in your environment. Um, but to get something up that works for dev test, um, it is just about that easy. And, and I would expect that you would spend about the two hours that we've uh, almost spent here doing it. Um, assuming you can provision your Linux machines uh, and hypervisors relatively quickly, uh, it should be about that easy. So. <clears throat> to let's see if I can jump back to uh, I'll leave you with this, which is where you can go to get uh, to get help when you start on your uh, your cloud project. So, CloudStack docs are there um, uh, at cloudstack.apache.org slash docs. Uh, we have an install guide, an admin guide, uh, release notes with every release, and we also have some uh, networking specific stuff. Um, IRC, there are a ton of people who are running CloudStack into production and have stubbed their toes on the same problems that you have, as well as a ton of developers that hang out uh, in either hash CloudStack or hash CloudStack-dev. Um, and so if I were having problems, that would be the first place that I would go to. Um, and uh, uh, obviously the website. There's a book um, put out by Packet uh, about CloudStack. It is generally, it is largely a rehash of the content from the install guide. Um, so I uh, don't know that there's a huge uh, additional increase in, in value there. Um, and if you want to talk about CloudStack today, there's a CloudStack booth, and uh, some of the folks from Shape Blue, uh, who are a CloudStack consultancy, are there. Um, there's some folks from Schuberg Phyllis who run CloudStack in production, uh, who are there, uh, as well as a number of folks who actually actively work on the project. Um, what questions have I not answered for you? Or let me turn that around. If I, if I handed you a USB stick with, um, with software, CloudStack software on it, and a bunch of machines, do you think you could go and get it installed? And actually, installation is the easy part, right? Yum, install CloudStack um, would take care of that. But do you think that there's enough context here to actually go and get things done? And if not, what's missing? Silence. So I did either a wonderful job, or everyone's asleep, or just want to go to lunch. Uh, given there's a trying to pull up, and the feature that was setting up physical interfaces on the hosts was. What what hypervisor were you using? Uh, I think it was KVM. 
Okay. <clears throat> so, if you actually read the documentation, um, they talk about defining physical interfaces um, and setting them up and going and editing a ton of files, and I'll actually maybe. This is actually one of my frustrations with most of this. Um, and that is... Uh, it's right here. Figuring the network bridges. Um, and so it talks about, oh, you're going to have multiple VLANs on the same interface. So create all of these bridge interfaces, um, and then it tells you to go do all of this stuff for each bridge, and then you have to go in the management server and do that. That is a configuration possibility. Um, I don't think that it serves you a ton of good, particularly, and again, coming back to the dev test defense, um, there's a guide, and I have not published it yet for 4.1, um, the quick install guide. And it is, I think when printed out, including front matter and index, it's 20 pages. So here is configuring libvirt and configuring QEMU, and that's it. So the, the install docs do talk about things that you can do, they are, in my opinion, overly complex because some people do actually want to have, um, to span multiple VIFs on a single interface or they want to have multiple interfaces um, sometimes bonded together. And the install documentation goes to great lengths to allow you to do anything you possibly could do, which I think makes it very hard for people to, to actually get up and going uh, up front. Um, I would try and use the quick install guide. Uh, the, the only material difference with the one that's published for 4.1 is we've changed package names. And so it's cloud stack in front of everything now rather than cloud. Um, but otherwise, um, you should be able to sit down with this guide and, and get a running cloud stack install in an hour, maybe, assuming you have you know, a single node install. You, you're not installing 500 physical nodes, but, but to get a single uh, management server and a hypervisor running on the same machine and working, uh, you should be able to do that in an hour with the quick install guide. And largely copy paste everything into it. Yes? Um, you mentioned about config management deployment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as a matter of fact, uh, I'll show you, maybe. Let me drop this down to. So there are native types and providers for, for Puppet and. Yeah, it's off the screen. So you can define an instance like this that you know, has name, uh, you're, you're uh, essentially establishing that it's going to be present or absent. If you need to destroy it, you need to change it to absent. Uh, you can tell it what zone. Uh, flavor is the service offering, uh, and uh, image is the uh, name of the template that you're deploying. Uh, and you can, I'm using group, but you can also use uh, uh, some other settings. Uh, uh, host data that's, that's communicated to it as well to set uh, facts or uh, to, act, to use CloudStack as a, uh, an ENC. Um, there's actually, if you'll look on my slide share, 
account, which is slideshare.net slash KE4QQQ. There's a presentation about, um, about uh, doing, um, uh, using Puppet to provision Cloud Stack instances. Um, and I think, we'll see, no. So here's one. So here is a here is a stack similar to what we saw with Chef, where we're defining two different types of machines. I did that very simply. You can also define uh, firewall rules and a number of other things. Um, Sebastian, who uh, who's a CloudStack um, contributor here in Europe, uh, he lives in Geneva. Uh, he wrote similar stuff for Salt. Uh, and I heard one of the uh, Shape Blue guys said that they were working on Ansible. So um, most of the uh, most of the um, config management bases are covered, or will be very shortly. Anything else I can answer for you? Um, feel free to come talk to me or visit the CloudStack booth. There are uh, tons of knowledgeable folks around. Um, Find us on IRC. You can find me on Twitter or feel free to email me as well. Uh, I appreciate your attention. We're at five minutes till, so I will cut us loose, and that way we can get in line for lunch first. So, Thanks very much. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you coming.